for that kind introduction. Thank you all for being here. Um, um, I confess these days when I come to Canada, I always worry a tiny bit um, whether or not they're going to let me across the border. Um, um, a couple of years ago, your um, foreign minister, Mr. Oliver, um, um, started giving a couple of speeches about how uh, foreign radicals were um, causing trouble for the tar sands in Alberta. Um, and since I was sort of the person who um, started the large civil disobedience action and stuff, I, I, I had a feeling he might kind of have meant me. Um, which in another way always kind of tickled me. Um, because, you know, I spent my elementary school years in Toronto. Um, my father was uh, the Canadian correspondent for that radical rag Business Week magazine. <laughs> and um, we lived in Leaside, and I went to, uh, you know, my formative years were spent at North Lee Public School, where as an enterprising reporter found out in a story he wrote about a year ago, one year ahead of me at North Lee Public School uh, uh, was one Stephen Harper. Um, um, so I don't know what it says about nature versus nurture or whatever, but my, my, my foreign radicalism, I really came by honestly um, um, uh, in, the, in the schools of Toronto. Um, We'll talk about climate change and things in a moment, and I'll, I'll, I'll maybe even show you a pic few pictures from the um, remarkable um, march in New York City of uh, eight, eight or nine days ago. Um, but I'm actually really grateful for the chance to speak a little more broadly tonight and to think about some of these questions in a sort of slightly broader context, at, at, at least for a minute. It's true that that book, The End of Nature, in 1989, came out 25 years ago this month, um, was the first book about global warming, and so some part of it was kind of reporting about what the scientists were finding out, but the other half of it was a kind of, um, well, a kind of essay, a sort of uh, lay philosophy, um, um, lay theology almost, a consideration of what it meant to live in a world where all of a sudden human beings were changing everything. When we'd gone from being what humans had always been, a uh, small presence in the face of a large planet, to just the opposite. This has come to be a more commonplace idea in recent years. Scientists beginning about 10 years later began to speak quite regularly about the Anthropocene, about the idea that we had left behind the Holocene, the geologic period, the last 10,000 years that coincided not coincidentally with the rise of civilization, a period of benign climatic stability that we're now uh, leaving behind um, for a world made by man in many ways. Um, we tend to focus on the practical and utilitarian consequences of that change, and rightly so. There's much to be afraid of from rising sea level and spreading disease and so on and so forth. But truthfully, the, the emotion that motivated that book in the first place was less fear than sadness and a sense that there were enormous losses that came in a world where human beings were absolutely everywhere at absolutely every moment. I've lived most of my life out in the deep woods in the wilderness. I was just talking with someone in the hall about our shared love for the Adirondacks where I spent most of my adulthood. And they're as wild a place as you get in the American East, you know. Um, um, the functional equivalent of Algonquin Park or someplace. And uh, I spent an awful lot of time, I spent an awful lot of my time roaming the woods in deep places, uh, deeply wild places. And I remember uh, a 
favorite quote of mine from Henry David Thoreau um, when he said, uh, uh, he was describing, he said he could walk a few minutes from his cabin in Walden and come to a place where no man stood from one year to the next and there consequently politics are not for politics are but the cigar smoke of a man. This was a somewhat more patriarchal age than ours, but you get the point. Um, I mean, I could walk, can walk, places from my house where I don't think any human beings have ever been except me. But if those places, if their seasons, if their flora, if their fauna are changing as a result of our habits and our economies and our lifestyles, um, then the idea that they're wild is called deeply into question. And, and that idea of our sudden increase in power and presence haunts me in a lot of ways. I think it's very much a recent development. The first intimation of it came in the mid 20th century when we figured out how to split the atom. And um, it was Oppenheimer there watching the initial explosion at Alamogordo who quoted from the Gita from the Hindu scriptures and said we are become as gods destroyers of worlds. Um, that idea that all of a sudden we had reached deity size was very powerful. And because we could imagine, we had a few examples too of Hiroshima and Nagasaki, because we could imagine what those huge mushroom cloud explosions would look like because we could feel them viscerally. So far, knock on wood, it has been possible for us not to go down that particular path, to shrink ourselves a little, at least in the uh, 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 in that realm. The trouble is it's been harder for us to imagine that the explosion of a billion pistons in a billion cylinders every minute of every hour on Earth could be producing change on the <laughs> same scale. And yet, of course, it is. Uh, we estimate, in fact, that the um, extra heat trapped by the carbon that we've poured into the atmosphere as we've burned coal and gas and oil. The extra heat is the daily equivalent heat in heat terms of about 400,000 Hiroshima-sized bombs. Um, that's been enough over the past few decades to melt most of the sea ice in the summer Arctic. Uh, it's enough carbon that the ocean is 30% more acidic than it was 40 years ago. We learned this week that the um, the melt of ice in the Antarctic has proceeded far enough that it's now causing measurable changes in the Earth's gravitational field as um, small but telling shifts. Uh, the drought in California is so unprecedented and so severe that we learned last week that we managed to evaporate about 63 trillion gallons of water and that's been enough the weight off the crust to allow the Sierra Nevada to jump about half an inch last year. Um, the scale on which we're working is astonishing um, in its size. And at the same moment, of course, we're working on the smallest of scales too. That book, Enough, from 2004 was about the biology at the other end of things and the, not the macroscopic scale but the microscopic and our increasing ability to at least consider um, the most fundamental changes in who we are as individuals. Um, I spent, spent a lot of time with the scientists at places like Princeton uh, uh, who are convinced that as we move further down into our ability to manipulate genes, we will soon reach the point where we can choose for and alter traits in our, um, in our offspring, um, including traits of uh, psychological um, 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 and intellectual traits, not just physical ones. Uh, a power 
uh, again, that we could not have imagined except in fiction uh, uh, only a few years ago. And let me add, by the way, that the best imaginer in fiction of, uh, 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 of all of that is your fellow Ontarian and my old friend Margaret Atwood, uh, whose work is, as often the case, incredibly prophetic about all these issues. I can think of almost, well, it's, oddly, it's uh, women from this part of the world who are doing the best job of figuring a lot of this out. The other book you should definitely pick up is Naomi Klein's uh, powerful new book on climate, mm -hmm. This Changes Everything, which we helped launch in New York uh, uh, two weeks ago. At any rate, that power at the smallest scale to change who we are raises the same kind of questions. When you have perfectly plausible uh, biologists saying that within a generation they'll be able to tinker with genes now as we can map uh, 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 where in the human brain different impulses are located that they'll be able to influence, say, the um, piety of human beings uh, 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 in future <coughs> generations. Um, we enter uh, another of these realms where suddenly our, our, our meaning, uh, our, our sense of who we are shifts dramatically. Our stature, our ability to intervene uh, at the largest level the whole planet level and at the smallest level, at the cellular level, is completely unprecedented. One of them is conscious and, and indeed um, uh, there's lots of people working hard to make it happen in genetic engineering labs uh, around the world. The other is inadvertent. There are very few people who think uh, 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 altering the planet's climate is a good idea, although there are a great many people who are willing to let it happen um, as opposed to taking the action we need to, to prevent it. But both of them raise the same deep questions about whether or not uh, we can rein ourselves in, in any kind of useful way. Um, if you think about the particular attributes of human beings, the things that make us distinctive, in the same way that birds have flight, say, it seems to me that the thing that makes human beings singular is that we're the animal that can decide not to do something that we're capable of doing. Um, the animal that could decide to restrain itself. And if you think about it a little further, really that's the, the part of us that um, our religious traditions and ethical traditions, at least as far back as the Buddha, have tried to kind of elevate and magnify. Um, 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 and the moment we live in is an interesting one because uh, uh, some of the warnings that people in uh, uh, long brown robes have been offering for millennia are now being joined by some of the warnings that people in white lab coats clutching computer printouts are, are making. Let's talk about climate change in particular because it's the most pressing of these questions and the one that bears down hardest on us. And let's talk about it. Uh, you know, I'm not going to bother listing any more than I already have the set of effects that we already see or really to try and scare you very much with what's coming. I mean, we've raised the temperature of the planet one degree. That's enough to melt the Arctic. We've clearly going to raise the temperature of the planet another degree, even if we do everything right from this point on. And that two degrees will be enough to cause unbelievable trouble. The increase in trouble will not be linear, it will be exponential as we move further up this curve, but we're on a track at the moment if we follow the policies laid out by our governments uh, around the world to raise the temperature between four and five degrees in the course of this century. And if we do that, we 
almost certainly can't have civilizations like the ones that we're used to. Um, the agronomists make it clear that from this point on, every increase of a degree in global average temperature should be expected to cut grain yields about 10%.